Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. So uh, today we're going to be working on a little production job and uh, I don't really do a lot of production work out here at the museum uh, and in some of the stuff that I do because typically you know we're just making one-off parts. Uh, we're repairing something, making a new part. Uh, but every now and then there's a need to make a series of parts that are basically all the same. Uh, and of course in a factory setting, in a commercial machine shop setting, that's what a lot of uh, machine shops do is they crank out hundreds if not thousands or ten thousands of the same part over and over and over again and have repeatability uh, between parts. Now uh, you know back in the old days uh, when uh, using the kind of equipment that I'm normally using uh, they had special machines for doing production work uh, specifically with lathe work they had turret lathes and screw machines were, which were both specialty lathes uh, they could be set up to repeat common tasks over and over and over again and be able to repeat the same part. The turret lathe was more of a manual machine uh, that could do multiple operations on the same machine, whereas a screw machine was more of an automatic machine that you would program uh, with cams and gears and things to manually make it do the same operation over and over. Nice thing about a screw machine is, is you could just kind of turn it on, walk off and leave it and it would crank parts out, whereas with a turret lathe uh, you'd have to have an operator sitting there running it. Uh, when I first started working in a machine shop back in the late 1980s, right out of high school, um, my first job was a turret lathe operator and uh, I spent uh, literally weeks uh, just sitting there becoming part of a machine and cranking out the same part over and over again. Well I don't have a turret lathe, I don't have a a screw machine and now in today's modern day we would use a CNC lathe, a computer controlled lathe to basically uh, do the same thing that would have been done on those old machines. All I've got is this old uh, engine lathe here, this Lodge and Shipley uh, manual lathe and uh, so but we're gonna kind of uh, take some lessons that I remembered from using uh, the turret lathe and kind of adapt it uh, to using an engine lathe here uh, to be able to repeat and do some, some, some same operations over and over again uh, to make this little part here. And uh, what this is, is this is a uh, what's called a key plug and it's a very uh, special uh, uh, item that would have been used in a safety head on a joiner or planer woodworking machine on the on the head that, that has the knives that spins around but it was used on a safety head on a crescent machine company either joiner or planer and uh, they came up with this safety head design back in the very early 1900s I think it was patented oh goodness around 1910 give or take a few years I can't remember the exact date uh, but uh, they used this design for probably I don't know 50 60 years uh, it was a very good design but this particular item would actually go down into a hole in the uh, in the the safety head and it's, it's seven eighths inch diameter around it has a threaded uh, set screw that goes through it but on one side there's this angle and uh, that basically creates a wedge and when you tighten this up in the bottom of a hole it pushes it up and it wedges the knives in place and it actually works pretty good. Uh, it's a rather unique uh, feature uh, on those uh, machines by, made by Crescent Machine Company. Uh, well interesting story and I, I got to share this because it's, it's just kind of cool. Uh, back in the early 2000s one of the very first pieces of woodworking machinery that I ever restored uh, it wasn't the first, but it was when I was really starting to get serious into it. I acquired a 12-inch crescent joiner from my own woodworking shop and uh, went through the process of restoring it and uh, uh, really turned out nice. In fact, I think that was the first time I ever uh, poured Babbitt bearings on the machine. It was an older machine, made early 1900s, uh, had a Babbitt head, but had this crescent safety head in it. Um, which I, When I got it, all the key plugs were there, everything was in place, and, and I restored that machine and I used it for many years. And at some point later in the mid to late 2000s, and again, I don't remember the exact date, uh, I had an opportunity to get a slightly larger joiner, uh, go from a 16 inch, I mean 12 inch to a 16 inch crescent. And uh, I decided to take the opportunity to get that bigger machine. That's the machine that I use now. And I had a, I actually had a video earlier where I showed how to change knives where you can actually see these key plugs being used. Uh, but long story short, the I sold my 12 inch joiner to a guy in Austin, Texas who bought it. He uh, was wanting it to, to build wooden entry doors for homes. And uh, he bought it from me. Uh, 
um, I actually met the guy when we uh, when, when we exchanged the lathe for some cash and uh, uh, in fact stayed in contact with him. He actually called me a couple of times asking some questions about setting the machine up or what have you and uh, uh, anyway stayed in contact with him up to probably a couple of years ago and, and you know just hadn't heard from him in a while. Uh, well um, over on the old woodworking machines forum I'm kind of known as the Crescent guy. I have a lot of Crescent Machine Company um, machines and uh, uh, anytime anybody has a question or problem with one, a lot of times they'll, they'll ask me because I seem to have some expertise in it. Well, a guy in Texas had just bought a 12-inch joiner that he found in a storage unit that was for being auctioned off, and it was missing some of the key plugs. Uh, he sent me some pictures of the machine, and I said, that looks an awful lot like that one that I sold that guy in Texas, and he was in Austin. I asked him, so what's the serial number on the machine? Sure enough, it's the same machine that I restored about many years ago. And uh, his, unfortunately, was missing about four or five of these key plugs. They'd been taken apart, and when the machine was sold, these were lost in the process. So he asked me if I could make up a few, and I know a couple other guys who are needing some as well. So I'm gonna run a little production job on these key plugs and uh, make them up. So uh, I was able to actually find the original mechanical drawings. Um, for this from a company up in Ohio that has a lot of the rights and patents and, and uh, still has stuff for Crescent Machine uh, uh, Company machines and uh, they made a copy of this and sent it to the guy I was needing for. So I have the actual mechanical drawings and I actually have a key plug out of that machine that I restored in the early 2000s as an example. So anyway, we got the, the lathe set up and we're going to run this production job here and just kind of go through the process and show you how to do it. So here we are looking at the lathe and um, you know the for this particular job I think really the key is having uh, this carriage stop in here where I can bring the carriage in and um, be able to stop it just bump it up against the stop and have a couple of different multiple stops here and this um, um, carriage stop was a project that I actually made here in the shop and uh, if you want to go back you can take a look at that video. Uh, in fact I built it for this job. Uh, it's got three stops on it. Now for this job I'm actually only needing two stops but when I was building this I wanted to have you know some extra capacity in it uh, for other jobs that we may run into down the road. Uh, so anyway I've got three different stops here but I'm only using two. So we're just chucking everything here in a scroll chuck, and I've got seven, seven eighths inch uh, cold rolled steel uh, that we're making this in out of. Uh, no need to do any turning. We can just use the, the rough uh, um, uh, or exterior finish on this cold rolled steel uh, in this particular job. All we're going to be doing is drill it, tap it, and then uh, put a chamfer on there, a 30 degree chamfer on there to a certain depth. Uh, and uh, we're just going to basically make the same part over and over again. Now I've already got the lathe set up. I came in here and it took a little while, but I think you'll see, I'm not gonna go through the exact setup on this because it is just taking some time and getting my st all my stops adjusted just right and getting everything where I can just go back there and repeat. But I think once you see it, you'll see the process uh, in operation. So uh, we got this in here. There's already a hole drilled in here from the previous uh, part. Uh, and it's just a little bit deeper uh, than it needs to be. And that's to give some clearance for the tap in there. Uh, so we're just gonna basically use that same hole and go on down. Ideally, you know, we would use a collet chuck rather than a scroll chuck for this job. And I do have a collet chuck for this lathe, but unfortunately I don't have a seven eighths inch collet right now and a new one costs about $150 and uh, that was a little bit out of the budget for this so uh, I'm just going uh, to use the, the scroll chuck and, and it'll be fine. Uh, it's not a super critical even if we get a little bit of a wobble in there uh, all we're doing is using is, is using a set screw to press against the bottom of a hole so it, it's, it's not absolutely critical if it's not running just absolutely perfectly true in this particular case. So I think what I'll do is on this first run is we're just going to kind of go through the operations and steps uh, slowly and kind of explain what's going on so you can see. So let's turn the lathe on. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, just put a little slight chamfer on the inside of that hole. So we're just going to use a little uh, deburring tool here. It doesn't need to be much and that's basic mostly just to take the uh, rough edge off from the, the parting hole that we had in the last operation. That's also to give a place for that tap uh, to start here in a mitt. The next step is, is we need to adjust this out to the right 
distance, and I need to be able to repeat that time and time again. So I've got just a tool holder in here, uh, and I'm not actually using it to cut. We're just going to use it as a stop. I'm going to drop down uh, this uh, stop on my carriage lot st uh, stop. We'll bump up next to it, and we will loosen the part in the chuck. And we're just going to slide this out until it comes up against there and lock it back down in place. Now we want to come in and uh, drill our hole to the right depth for the next part. And uh, I'm just using one of my taper shank drills here. And uh, because this will be tapped, uh, uh, tapped half inch 13, I'm drilling that uh, 2760 force uh, again with one of my taper shanks. And uh, I've just got some tape on the shank of that drill bit uh, to mark so I'll know about where the depth is I need to stop. And that's again not a critical measurement. Uh, we're just trying to make sure we have plenty of clearance for the tap uh, to go down into the park. We're going to swap out uh, the drill bit for our tap. And again, I'm using a half inch 13 uh, tap here. And I'm using a spiral tap uh, mainly because it will cause the chips to come out of the top of the hole rather than going down and, and packing into the bottom of the hole. And uh, you're just less likely to get a uh, break that way. I'm going to slow the lathe down for this operation. And we'll uh, put a little tapping fluid on there. And uh, I've just got the, the, the tailstock sliding here. And uh, we'll come in and we're going we're gonna to tap it down the full depth of the tap, basically, is what I determined uh, we need to go on the depth. So we'll start that in, just lightly feed it forward. When we get to the bottom, we just reverse and come right back out of the hole. The next operation is we need to put the 30 degree chamfer on here. And to do that, I've just got a, a tool uh, with a 30 degree angle on there. And uh, I'm bumped it up to the same stop that we used uh, for setting uh, the depth. Uh, just worked out that I could use the same stop there. And I'll speed our lathe back up. And I'm just going to feed in. I've got a mark here on the dial that tells me how deep I need to go. And obviously that's where I'm starting at. But uh, we'll come around. I'm just going to mark, watch for that mark to come up. And boom, we're there. And the final step here is we need to part it off. So uh, I've got a parting knife here, parting blade. Uh, we're going to come up to the same stop we used before. And it off the link. Once the part comes off the machine, we'll come over to the uh, drill press and uh, just lightly touch that to take that burr off the inside. And uh, this outside edge will just deburr uh, on the sanding wheel or on the grinder, just put a light uh, deburr around that. So now that you've seen it kind of in slow motion, let's go through here and we'll actually crank out a couple of parts in real time uh, to see how this process goes on the lathe.